Good morning. Let's all stand and we're going to sing Blessed Be Your Name this morning. nothing better than blessing his name. That's what we're here for. We came for that audience of one, and that's who we're here to serve. That's who we're here to worship this morning. And I ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way to the front. We are so thankful to have each and every one of you. We've got a lot going on at the church. We've got a lot coming up. Uh, most importantly, we have the Easter service coming up at the end of this month. Uh, we just ask that you, if you're visiting with us, we hope to have you back for that service. Uh, we are looking forward to it and the message that not only the uh, cantata is bringing, but Brother Pete's bringing as well. There's not a greater message than the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to take our offering, and I'd like to ask uh, Brother Greg Owens, would you open up in a word of prayer?
Amen. That song at the cross that they just played there, it's, it's where all of it happened. It changed the world for us. And we're just so thankful that uh, God is mighty enough to save us. And that's what this next song is. It's saying mighty to save. It's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. this morning that he did conquer that grave on the third day and he rose again. I pray that if you do, say amen. And let's sing this verse too. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, oh fill my life again, I give my life to follow. Everything I believe in Now I surrender Oh Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save next song we're going to do is called Who You Say I Am. He has ransomed 
while I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for this day you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the rain that you've given us this week. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for the freedom that we have to still come and meet in your house and to lift your son's name up and, and praise, Lord. I'm so thankful for what you sent him to do on this earth for us and die for us on this cross. God, I just ask that you continue to bless this service. I continue to you ask that you bless this church. Lord, we just thank you and we love you and we know we're beyond blessed and what we deserve, Lord. I thank you for... Thank you for this church. I thank you for our pastor. Thank you for the messages he's about to bring, Lord. Um, I'm just so thankful that you were able to rise from that grave on the third day, Lord, and that you, you came and most importantly did what you said you were going to do. Lord, I ask that you forgive us and I ask that you uh, just continue to be with us and go with the rest of the service. In Christ, I pray, amen. We're going to sing Graves in the Gardens. God of the mountain, yeah, 
is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing. It's better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Let's do that again, it's our voices Oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Can we say amen? amen. Wow. <laughs> By the way, I just want to say thank you, praise team, every one of you that have a part choir. Yeah, that's okay. Amen. They, they, they pour their hearts into worship every Sunday that we come together, and I appreciate so much the effort that they bring. Um, and the message, more importantly, that they convey in Jesus Christ. And so I want to invite you to Luke 23. Luke 23, we begin this uh, week with a three-week series I'm super excited about. At the cross, I appreciate uh, Nelson and Matt helping me get this cross together uh, on very short notice. It was a quick text message while I was gone. I, um, I thought, wow, we need a visual. This would be great. I thought we might have one. We didn't actually have one, so they... Help build that, and I appreciate so much. It gives a little visual. So let's just get this out of the way real quick. I'll jump into the Word in a moment. We'll pray. But is it the worst spoiler alert ever? Jesus is risen, right? Amen? I mean, we know this already, I hope, okay? If you don't, you're going to be in for a, a, for a rude awakening, and I, and I it'll be a great awakening because uh, there is no greater story than the risen Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. We're going to come across seven sayings at the cross over the next three weeks. We're going to bring them under three words, and you're going to see that momentarily. But let's let the scripture speak, and then we'll pray. God's word says in verse 32 of Luke 23, and there were also two other uh, malefactors. Luke used the word malefactors. Uh, The other gospels like the word thieves. They're, They're criminals is the idea we would say today. Led with him to be put to death. Let that... Soak in for a moment when you think about the cross. We have a different idea of this in a beautiful way. It was a very difficult image uh, to anyone in their culture then. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, 
one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Father God, may the clarity of the word be crystal clear today that you sent your one and only son to give his life upon Calvary for my sins, our sins, the sins of all the world. Father, we don't deserve, we, we don't have a place in your court. We don't even have really right to legal representation, but yet in your great love and your great sacrifice and your great atonement, we are free and yes, free indeed. We thank you, Father, for what the cross means, but we know that it is not the cross alone. It is the Christ of the cross that makes all the difference. And so my heart, Father, is towards each and every one today who does not know the gospel of Jesus Christ in a personal way. May salvation come. May restoration come. May healing come. May strength come, Father. May joy come. May peace come because of what we see and the beauty of your forgiveness. For we pray this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. It is good to be in God's house today. Thank you for uh, this last week. It was a beautiful week of being away to recharge a little bit uh, around the kiddos and the family and the grands and everybody. And it was a wonderful time. But I've been so looking forward. I've kind of been like the rocket launch that the smoke is coming out and you see the countdown clock, and I've been so excited about this day coming. So today is week one of three weeks of At the Cross. And so when you think about Easter, there are so many messages that could easily come to mind. This is one I've never preached before, just being honest. I've, I've dealt with the different sayings at different aspects, but I've never put them under one umbrella. And we're going to do that the next three weeks. And so we're going to look at, first of all, the word forgiveness. And eventually we'll get to the idea of forsaken and then ending with finished in those three words we'll look at. So if you haven't already, by the way, gotten one, go ahead and get you about eight, 10, 100 of these if you want. There's plenty out there. We'll, we'll stock more. This is an opportunity for you to say, hey, church, hey, community, let's go. And, and this is a great way of telling people, we want you to come be a part of what we're doing here at Landmark. Easter Sunday and Christmas are the two most attended Sundays out of a calendar year. And there are people that we all know who really need Jesus in their life. Maybe they're going through a tough time right now. So you telling them, hey, here's a ticket. I just want to invite you to our Easter program um, in two weeks or this week or whatever time you choose to give it out. And uh, we'll have the story, which will be our musical, our cantata that will be presented by our choir. And we're looking forward to that. And then uh, the message... And then after that, and we'll culminate that message when it is finished. And, and then on the back, you see we'll have our egg hunt. And this is a reminder for you to help out with that. And you can bring things for that and such. And those baskets are, are out in the lobby area. But this is an opportunity. So I encourage you, please, tell them, it's a, hey, it's a free ticket. We want you to come. And so uh, it'll be a reminder to them. Pull them to put it on their refrigerator. Um, if they're like us, we like to eat. And there it is. So, you know, it's a good reminder, right? So... Anyway, uh, at the cross is what we'll be finishing up with that day, but we're going to be talking about that the next three weeks. I want you to think about what Jesus did when he went to Golgotha, Calvary, and he climbed Mount Calvary. Uh, what we see in the cross, if I just give you a two-minute uh, tutorial, is not really what Jesus, Jesus didn't carry this entirely. He would carry a beam, and, and, and understand he'd had a, a, a horrible, horrible scourging uh, whipped 39 times with bone chips and leather straps that would just continue to rip at him. And he was, he was literally beaten more than half to death by the time he ever got the board on his back. And he would carry it up and there would be a, a, a crowd of people and, uh, as he went to the cross. And, and, and there would, it was a spectacle made in mockery of him. And, and of course, people were there uh, because of the uh, time of Passover and some didn't understand what was going on, and it was confusing to a lot of people. And here was Jesus and the Roman soldiers walking alongside him. And it was to a point where he couldn't even carry it any longer. So uh, Simon, not Simon Peter, but Simon was summoned 
uh, you get over here, put them, put the, you carry it for them, and Jesus is barely staggering at this point to get to the cross where we see him eventually come in our text. Um, it's about 9 o'clock when the, they have fixed the boards together in a way like they did. Usually there'd be a groove, and they would come in, and they would raise them up as they were uh, there. Of course, the others were bound. Jesus would be nailed uh, in a way uh, to show how much there was such disdain and hatred for him. And so from nine to roughly three o'clock, six hours of the most excruciating pain a person probably ever endured on planet earth, uh, he, he endured the cross. He took on man's sin. We know what it meant, and that's what forgiveness means. Along that path conveys one simple truth. Jesus died so that you and I might live. At the end of the day, this was not done so we can have Easter Sunday, nor was, was Jesus born into this world so we can have Christmas, so eventually we get to the cross and have Easter. This was done so that you and I could live. Picture yourself, if you will, at the worst chasm possible. There's no hope. The floodwaters are coming in, and there's no way out. You have no way. You, you're, I know you're strong, and I know you work out, and I know you have cardio or whatever you may uh, claim to know. But here's the truth of the matter. That's what Jesus saw in the world around us. People were dying. No hope. And there's got to be more. And so in steps Jesus. The waters are rushing in. Nobody can swim. Nobody can climb. The mud is now there to where it's impossible to scale. And so the only hope that man has is that someone throw out the lifeline that is the cross of Calvary. Somebody save me because I'm going to die in this condition without any hope. Please, somebody. And this is where Jesus steps in. And he says, I'll be the one. And in fact, he would be the only one that could because he never knew any sin. Jesus died so that you and I might live all upon the cross, all for man. And sin. This is where the word forgiveness is spoken. So we see two pictures of the word forgiveness in this text. The first two sayings of the cross. The first we read in verses 32 through 34. And we see there that Jesus is led along along the way. And he's, he's also um, uh, these two thieves, these two criminals. And so they nailed Jesus to the cross. And somewhere in this timeline, along this way, whether it's as they nail him or as he's raised up and he looks around at these people, he utters the first saying of the cross, which is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. He, he, he embraces forgiveness. I want you to think about for a moment, just for a moment, your worst possible pain that you ever incurred. Now, I want you to think for a moment, maybe that wasn't something purposeful. Maybe it was something accidental, okay? Maybe somebody dropped something or maybe something got pinched or something happened along the way. And you had, but let's not put the blame on you. Let's think it might have been one of the kids or maybe it was uh, one of your buddies. Your first words, let's be real, your first words, your first actions, your first inclination that, ow, in like the worst possible manner, right? It's not, Father, forgive them. They didn't mean it. I want you to understand, Jesus was literally shredded at this point to where his internal organs are probably semi-exposed, okay? He is bled. I mean, his, his visual imagery, there's no recognition and they haven't even put the crown of thorns on him yet, but this is, this, is, this is coming, I mean, in this part. He's coming to the cross, and, and, and he's half dead. And he gets to the cross, he looks at everybody, and nobody in their right mind does what Jesus does. And he says, Father, forgive them. Father, I want to invoke grace. I want to invoke mercy. <laughs> And he says, I just love them that much. Father, forgive them. Understand, the, the word them is interesting there in the context because history kind of debates about this. And some people say, no, 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 it was the Romans because they're the ones that had the final say-so. 
And was Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, as in Rome, you know, they were just a part in the grand scheme of things. We know that God was using Rome in order for Christ to come to the cross. It's interesting, when, when the Passion of the Christ came out years ago, uh, many uh, of, of Roman descent took offense to the accusation in the movie, but it, it, it was biblical, you know. God was allowing this to happen for a greater purpose. But there's speculation, was, was, was the them specifically towards Rome? Well, we know that in Peter's eyes, it certainly wasn't specifically towards Rome. Peter looked at it as a part of the Jews' problem. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, conveys some of his sentiment, which was not kind words, mind you. It was pretty harsh. Acts chapter 3, um, let's look at that. Acts chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Scripture records there, the God of Abraham, this is Peter's words, of Isaac, of Jacob, the God of our fathers, uh, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. So he doesn't blame Pilate. Pilate was there, but he blames the Jews when he was determined to let him go. So he actually kind of exonerates him a little bit. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life. Whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So you see in this context here, in these scriptures, Peter has no problem pointing the finger at the Jews. So was it Rome? Is it the Jews? Well, the likelihood is it was probably a mixture of both. And really and truthfully, it didn't stop there because it still comes down to us. Because we have the need for Christ and Christ crucified. So it was my sins, it was your sins, it was our sins that took Jesus by way of Calvary to the cross. Neither the Jews nor the Romans ever fully comprehended that they were crucifying the king of kings. Even though the, scripture, the subscription was put above, the title was literally put on the cross, more in mockery and jesting of who he was. But he says, Father, I want you to forgive. Let's focus on that word for a moment. Father, Forgive. This is a reference going back to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12 in this picture of Christ and when he would come and the prophecy of Isaiah. He says, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. There's the thieves. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is us. This is the word forgive. He says, I'm stepping in and I'm covering your sin. I'm atoning for your sin. I'm forgiving your sin. Jesus was simply practicing when he said, Father, forgive them, exactly what he told his disciples to do and those that would follow him. You must forgive those who harm you. We see that later on carried over in Paul's writing to those in Ephesus. And so God and in, in, in looking down upon man and man's sin, he used the evil activity of Rome and the Jews for a greater purpose for all of mankind. I want you to think about where you and I stand. Let's just say for a moment the cross is not the cross and Christ is not on the cross. Do you understand the gravity of the circumstance? Well, we still got landmark. Probably not. You need to think about this. I want you to think about something even bigger. If, if there is no Jesus, now we might have some version, is there a gospel in a New Testament? If there is no cross and there is no Christ? I mean, the Old Testament speaks of the coming Messiah. We just read one of those prophecies. The New Testament conveys the life of Christ in four gospels and continues to speak of Jesus throughout, not only his first and second coming, I hope you understand everything we know about Christianity crumbles if Christ is not on the cross. It is that critical, that moment. And again, of course, the devil, being the devil, he tried to come in and persuade him otherwise. And the temptation, as uh, we studied a few weeks back, uh, last actually two weeks back, um, and so we saw what the devil tries to do in all these things. So, it's important that we come to the cross and we see Christ, but not just see Christ, we embrace the forgiveness of Christ. Because if Jesus dies on the cross, and you're going to see this momentarily, and there is no forgiveness received, 
The question is not if Jesus bade forgiveness. Of course he did. Absolutely, unquestionably, cross Christ, forgiveness. Jesus didn't have to do this for himself. He did it for us out of great love and forgiveness for our sin. But because of our need for personal atonement, he, he stepped in as the prophecy conveyed so that we would not have to go, that he would step in our place because we could not cover our sins in our own. We must be careful, though, not to confuse the cross for total absolution. I'm giving you a $10 word. You're not absolved of your sin because of alone what Jesus did. Jesus paid it all, yes. But Jesus dying on the cross gives us opportunity to now receive forgiveness of sin. I'm going to show you what I mean by that momentarily. He says that, let's drop down to verse 35. He says, Father, forgive them. And in verse 35, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with him, derided him. This is a word that they're basically making fun of Christ. They're not saying this in hopes. They're saying this in mockery because he claimed to be king. He saved others, which we know he was king. I don't want to say it that way and leave that there. He saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God, the Christos, the anointed one. Verse 36, and the soldiers also mocked him. They're just, this is just such a spectacle of Satanism around the cross. Coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of Jews, save thyself. So they're, they're continuing this repetition of mockery. And a superscription, this is what we were talking about earlier, was written of him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. So all the known languages that would have been able to read, nobody would have missed the message. This is the king of the Jews, verse 38. Again, placed in mockery. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. This guy's like, if you can't beat him, join him. So he jumps in and starts making fun of Christ. He's, he's deriding him, railing on him making a mockery. If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Three times we just read that was mentioned. If you're the Christ, not mentioned in, in sincerity, but more in, in, in mockery, save thyself and us. This thief, I, I, I had to comment on this, probably didn't want the attention drawn to himself. He's already hearing it from the people that are there in a spectacle. And by the way, there would be a spectacle. There would be people coming through. It was a very busy time in Jerusalem. And so there would be people coming through and, and there were people be gathering to watch this. It's kind of grotesque when you think about, right? Hey, I want to, what are we doing today? Let's go watch somebody die. But this is a different culture, a different time period. And this is what they did. And so they would go and watch. Now, granted, maybe some of these were people that they wanted to see resolve. We know that when we see exterminate, uh, uh, terminations of life, if you will, um, uh, there'll be people that will have seatings to witness uh, electric chairs and such like this. So this would be something maybe along those lines for those people who needed that um, visual, I guess, if you will, to, to find closure to these thieves, whoever had done them wrong, I don't know. Um, but there's a crowd. And so the thief decided to jump in, maybe get the monkey off his back, so to speak, but verse 40 is interesting, and this gives us a picture of two different individuals and possibly where you might be today. But the other answering rebuked him, not Christ, but this other thief. So now you got a crosstalk going. Jesus in the middle, this guy's over here, this guy's over here. I don't know which one it was to the other, but whichever one decided if he's on the left or right of Christ, it makes no difference. One of them spoke up and said, enough. He says, um, Verse 40, the other answering rebuked him, dost not thou fear God? Wait a minute, there's a change. There's a change. Something's different from before. This guy wasn't like this before. He's watching Christ. He's going to church literally as he sits next to Christ on a cross, and he sees what true Christianity looks like. Forgiveness is invoked. Seeing thou art in the same condemnation. Condemnation is basically a sentencing. We're all sentenced, and that's what he's saying here. We're all equally sentenced. Why, why would you put him down? And this is what he says about it, verse 41. We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss or nothing wrong. 
And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's a very strong statement that is being made here. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's some great, we could go in some probably four or five doctrines with this picture right here. Obviously, see, you see the Son of God, so you see the divinity. Uh, you see grace. I'm not going to do all this right now, but, but there's so many biblical truths that are going on in this conversation, in this picture of Jesus on the cross. That's why we can't miss this. We've got to see it for what it is. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Let's focus on that statement. Two men are on the cross, one on each side of Jesus, both making wrong decisions that led them to the place. The one uh, criminal even admitted the fact, hey, we deserve to be here according to the law. So we, we're receiving what is justly due to us. We, we, may, we don't know what they did that brought them to this point. The Bible doesn't say, and I'm going to tell you, it really doesn't matter. The point is, is they're there, and I believe they're there because God wants us to see the path that we might be on today. Both of them before Christ. Today, you and I stand before Christ. Maybe not literally in a physical sense as they did, but both through the presence of his spirit. Uh, both with opportunities for salvation. Let's remember that Jesus came for all. You say, well, this guy, we don't know how bad they were. It doesn't matter how bad they were. We're all bad in God's eyes because of our sin natures. We're, we're not squeaky clean as we like to maybe think of ourselves. We all deserve the death, uh, eternal death and hell. But yet, in steps Jesus. Two responses. One thief chose to join the crowd. We've already elaborated on that. If you're truly the Messiah, save yourself and us. Well, he's trying to look for a quick ticket out of here, but he really knows that he's probably going to die sitting there. So he says, if I'm going to go, I might as well go out with not having all these people making fun of me. But the other thief didn't look at the crowd. He looked at his own condition. See, this is critical to us, and I don't want to get too... Uh, some people take biblical truth and they try to stretch it to make a really cool point. I can make a really cool point out of this and go, wow, and you guys can go around and tell your buddies, see, preacher was talking and we're so busy looking at crowds today and everything else. We are, let's be real, but what we really need to see is not the crowd. We need to see us. We need to see our own condition. We need to see where we stand. I, I stand in need. I, I can't go back to a place where me and Christ came to the cross. I've gone to church, I've seen crosses, I've heard about Jesus, I've, I've had the Bible open, I've got four or five Bibles like a lot of people, and I know what the Bible, but do you know Christ? You see, the Bible will only get you so far, but do you know Christ? That's the real question today. Do you know Christ's forgiveness? Both of them heard the message. They both were witnesses to the things that Jesus would say, but only one would make the right decision. It's interesting. This thief saw his condition. He was sentenced. He was a sinner. And he asked in faith not to be rescued. Isn't that interesting? The one guy said, hey, get us out of here. The other thief said, Lord, I want to be with you for eternity. He didn't ask to come off his punishment. He just asked to be pardoned. He said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. See, he's got his mind on what matters rather than the things that don't matter as much. Well, if I get off this cross, I'll, I'll be a better person. That's self-reformation. That's not what God is looking for. You know, we read in the Bible where uh, those, those spirits were inhabiting an individual, and they left, and that person swept up the house, and they did a good job making themselves look pretty and everything else. The problem was they never got right with God, though. And all it did was give them more opportunity, and more came in, and it was worse at the end than it was before is what the Bible tells us. There's a picture there. We can't self-reform. We, we can't, I, I'll go to church all the time, and I'll, I'll read the Bible through in a year, and I'll do, a, all those things are wonderful. Don't misunderstand. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to be a very religious person burning forever in hell. That's all it's going to mean. And there's not a single person that knows Christ would ever want you to do that. That's why we do things like this. Because we want people to come and hear about Jesus. I'm asking you, this isn't for people that go to First Baptist. Let them go to First Baptist. That's their church. I'm not interested in taking, uh, that's not our aim here. That's, we're, we're looking at Great Commission. We're looking at bigger, okay? We're looking at those people who are unchurched, who are in need of Christ, in need of hope, in need of strength. 
that only Jesus can bring. And, and so we say, come, and we invite them to Christ. We invite them to the cross, and we let them know that Jesus died for them and their sin. See, the, Jesus could only take the first thief criminal so far. But all he wanted to do was get off the cross in that moment. He didn't want Jesus for eternity. Do you see the difference? The second thief had other words. He said, Lord, remember me. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. You, there's a difference. And the, the, really, it comes down to the word repentance. Isn't that what Jesus preached when he picked up the mantle from John the Baptist? Jesus comes along and he says what? Same thing John did, repent. Repent. That's a word in 2024 most people get scared of. Why do we get scared of change? Chad, I'm glad I'm not the way I used to be. I've known you for a while. I'm glad you ain't either, by the way. But anyway, you know, <laughs> aren't we glad? I mean, the joker I was back in a gap, man, I'm telling you, I don't want to be that dude. That's not where we're supposed to be. What changed? What, what, what transited? Well, Jesus came in, and with Jesus, change is possible. Well, I can change, yeah. You know, it's funny, I, I, <laughs> I, I, January 1st, 2024, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, right? How's that change working out for you, by the way? So far, so good? Gain five. Hey, wrong direction, but nice effort, right? We, we don't give out trophies for dieting, though. It doesn't work that way. You, you see what I'm trying to say? I can't do things on my own. You can't do things on your own. We need Christ in everything. Let's just be honest. But especially and ultimately when it comes to salvation, because without Christ, there is no salvation. How do I get saved? Repentance. I've got to decide right now in this moment that I'm in that I'm not going to be what I am. But I can't do it on my own. I've got to come by way of the cross. See, if I say I want to change, but I skip the cross, there is no ultimate change. The only way that truly repentance comes is by way of the cross, realizing that the way I'm going is not the right way, and there's got to be a change. So while that one thief said, I don't want repentance, I just want to get out of this predicament I'm in, the other thief said, I don't like this, and I have no hope in this life. My only hope is in Jesus Christ, and he made the change while the other thief continues metaphorically to keep walking. The other came to Christ, and he said, I want change. Remember me. When you're, you enter into your kingdom, this was a prayer of repentance and forgiveness that Jesus had extended. And so we see two different outcomes. The first thief would die in unbelief and spend eternity in hell. The Bible tells us in Luke 13 and 3, unless you repent, it's a biblical word, you will all likewise perish. And the word perish means uh, that eternal sentence in, in hell. The second thief would know an eternal heaven. Because of faith in Jesus and his sacrifice for sin. I want you to take into consideration this thought. When you think about what this thief did, <laughs> the, the picture is worth a thousand words. I, did anybody catch anything about baptismal waters by chance? Did I miss that part? So the, the thief didn't get baptized. Well, that kind of puts a kibosh on a lot of people's religion, doesn't it? I thought you had to be baptized to go to heaven. By the way, John the Baptist never got baptized either. The Bible doesn't record. What do you do with that? Jesus changed the rules in the middle of the game? No, of course he didn't. It's always been by faith and repentance and the coming Savior. It's, it's, so there, there's no religious activity required. You, you, well, well there's, no, there's no baptism. There's no communion. There's no church membership. How long have you been a member of the church? Can you imagine a thief? Uh, what are you talking about? I, I did this last year with you. Miss Eva reminded me because she shared one of my favorite posts. Uh, Alistair Beggs, speaking of the man on the middle cross, said I could come. I love that little blip that he puts out there. But, but it's powerful. What, what, about, what about, what do you do with justification? What? <laughs> well, well, can you give me the 66 books in order? <laughs> what? <laughs> he couldn't do any of this. I mean, he's about as fresh born of a babe in Christ as there is. But he's born because of Christ and the sacrifice that he gave, not because of anything he could do in his own merit. It's, it's critical that we understand, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Nothing in myself can save me. Nothing in yourself can save you. But by Jesus Christ can one be saved. That's what we must comprehend. Jesus saves, period. 
No additives, no preservatives, okay? By the way, what did he tell them? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Did I read that right? Is that what y'all read too? Well, that kind of eliminates that little purgatory thing, doesn't it? Today means today. Well, let's get the Greek lexicon out and see what it says. Guess what? (laughs) Today's today. There's no purgatory. There's no, uh, we'll get there when we get there kind of thing. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Thirdly, this is not a universal pardon. You know, Jesus died on the cross means we're all automatically absolved of all sin. The atonement has been made. I don't have my wallet with me. That's probably a good thing. All right. This ain't worth nothing. All right. Maybe this will be worth something. But Johnny, I'm going to have a key on here in a couple, couple weeks, right? Can't wait. And, and that key is going to get me in his house. So that's probably the biggest thing I can show you a value that I don't have. So let's pretend like, let's pretend like, let's pretend like Philip. Spider-Man key, you remember this one, you gave me this a while back for something else. We'll put it like Spider-Man key, this will keep your attention for at least two seconds, okay? It's the key to the house, okay? So Spider-Man key is here, and I say, you know what, I'm going to give you this key. When do you, t- when do you get the key to this house, though? Me sticking it out to you doesn't mean the transaction's been completed yet, does it? Until you take it for yourself. It doesn't lessen the fact of what Christ did. Don't misunderstand that. But there are people, and maybe perhaps even listening today, that are under the delusion, well, Christ died for my sins on the cross, so I'm automatically absolved. No, sir, no, ma'am. He made the means possible. The same way that key is a representation of the opportunity. But until you receive it for yourself, it's always just going to be there. But it won't always be there when it comes to Christ. Because this is a limited time offer. We know that He's coming back, amen? And so this is going to change things dramatically. Only one thief is given the promise of heaven because his right response was given in repentance and faith. This man chose Christ. He didn't, show, he didn't choose a quick way out. He chose Jesus. And that's what we want to offer to you today. Oh, you can remedy yourself a little bit here or there, but it's not going to alleviate eternal hell. You must come by way of the cross. It's at the cross where all this takes place. Do you know Jesus, friend? Are you considered, would you, by the biblical answer, not by mom or daddy's answer, not by what you heard in church one time's answer, but the biblical answer, do you know Jesus as Savior today? If you were to die, God forbid, do you know you'd be in heaven? Jesus told that thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. Do you know him as Savior? Today, we want to give you that opportunity to know Christ as your Savior. We invite you to come. We invite you to receive him. All we want you to do is just say yes. Not by coercion, but by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to do that today, we're available. There'll be me and there'll be some others along the front here with me to help you if you have questions about this decision. And there's still many others that are close by that would be glad to help as well. I want to invite you to stand as we have this time. Let's pray. Father God... May you lead in this time of decision. Father, may your spirit pour out in such a way that we will literally feel compelled to come by way of the cross. Thank you, Father, for sending your son, knowing what was going to happen. For your son coming, knowing what was going to happen, and yet doing it out of great love for forgiveness, for atonement for eternal salvation. And Father, I pray today, not just for salvation, but Father, us as believers, may we not forget why we are here, what it's all about, Father, that we not just get so caught up in our world that we forget about the beauty and the message of Christ's cross and who Jesus is and what he means to us. May you be glorified in the decisions of the day, and for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.